Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity of presenting special guest Vincent Soberano, actor, award-winning film TV director, writer, producer, martial arts coach, and sports hall of famer. Vincent studied film and television in San Diego, California, where he first started working for Stu Seagull Productions in 1991. He later moved to Los Angeles and worked in a variety of film and TV projects until eventually transitioning to the IT industry. Vincent now works in Asia behind and in front of the camera. He recently wrote and directed the horror action film Circle of Bones, which is currently in distribution and the winner of the Best Director and Best Feature Film and Best Actress Awards at the Vegas Film Awards. It also received acclaim as Best Screenplay at the Horror House Film Festival in Los Angeles. Vincent is also the writer and director of the action fantasy film Blood Hunters, Rise of the Hybrids, which won Best Feature Film at the NYCA Film Festival in New York. His recent works as writer and director also include the martial arts epic drama The Trigonal, which premiered in Cannes on May 12, 2018, and the multiple award-winning short, We Are War. Vincent also directed the award-winning National Geographic Channel documentary On the Brink, on Uncharted Waters. In addition, he was the action director of the action comedy blockbuster, Ganda Rapido, The Revenger Squad, which broke Philippine box office awards in 2017. It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity of presenting Vincent on the show. He is well-versed in a lot of acting, film, and directing projects, and I'm excited to have him on. He's uh, been an actor with credits in Jackie Chan's Police Story Lockdown in 2013, the UFC's The Ultimate Fighter China for season 2014, Blood Hunters 2016, as I mentioned earlier, The Trigonal 2018, Blood Hunters Rise of the Hybrids, Circle of Bones, A Hard Day, and two-time award-winning Sergio Gutierrez Garza's latest drama, Stay at Home. It's with great pleasure I welcome Vincent to the show. Welcome to the show, Vincent. Hey, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me on uh, on your show. It's a pleasure. And right now you're in Taipei, Taiwan. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. great to have you on the show, and I appreciate you joining us today. <laughs> Thank I, you. Thank you. I want to ask you, you have a lot of production projects under your, under your belt, a lot of credits. And I want to ask you, how did you first become uh, a director, an actor, and be involved in the industry? I went to film school in California uh, back in the, uh, the mid nineties. And, you know, I, I worked, I worked in the film industry for a while. And then uh, during the, the internet boom, the whole, you know, I, IT boom, I transitioned to IT. I figured, Hey, you know, why not? You know, sounds, you know, sounds fun. I see everyone, a lot of my friends like uh, turning, you know, turning into millionaires, like, overnight I'm like hey let me jump on board so I you know so I went into the IT industry for a little while worked on that until I decided you know what I really need to go back to film I moved to um, I moved to Beijing actually on a work project and then around that time that's when I decided I want to to you know to go back to 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 film work and um, I started I've always you know I've always grappled with what my um, what my direction is in film I you know I thought I would be a, maybe a, an editor or, you know, or cameraman or whatever, but it just evolved over time because I'm a writer, you know, that's my, I feel that's my strongest suite, even though I never really looked at it um, that way, but I'm, 
but I love to write. And so I, I, I write a lot of scripts. I've written so many scripts. And eventually I decided, you know what, let me, let me, let me direct my own. Let pitch, I'll pitch my own scripts and see if I can, you know, get any producers interested and start directing them, you know. And um, so I started doing that. I started pitching and then I had a few opportunities to, to, to direct my own scripts. And, you know, the rest is history. And here I am now. <laughs> say this i i appreciate that you have this creative energy and that you can share it on our show because one of the things i like to do is present notable people and when we when i when i looked at your information i was like man i would love to have you come on and talk about how you got started but more importantly the flow of the creativity in your life and i know it takes a lot to express one's creativity in different projects and to take an idea and put it into fruition i want to ask you like from your vantage point what have you found creativity is done for you in the sense of being able to establish your projects. Like, do you do anything to kind of channel that creativity or is it something that you find you're, you're like, like I'll take a notepad with me. And if I have an idea for a concept, I'll write it down. I'll have it with me. I'll put it on my phone. Like I'll get different things that just pop in my head and I need to mm -hmm. act on. And it's like, a, it's like an itch. I got to scratch if I have an idea right. for a concept or something. Right. So I want to ask right. you, do you have like a similar thing you go through when you go through these creative vibes like do you pick up on something and you're just writing it down in the middle of the day you're like i need to create this movie right so first of all as uh <clears throat> as an artist as a, as a creator my strongest suit is writing i'm a ma mainly a writer one of the first things i do when i have an idea is i just write it down you know i write it down and i i build up on it sometimes nothing comes out of it <clears throat> until maybe about a year later you know i go back and i see a something I wrote and I just, I just have an epitome or whatever. And I'm like, Oh my God, this can be something good. And I just, then I start going off. It's happened so, <laughs> so many times in that, you know, where I had an idea that I wrote like half wrote like two years, three years ago, some, <laughs> some, some of them even 10 years ago, then they resurrect them, you know, just like the movie blood hunters, you know? And so, but what writing does for me is it, um, and what my creativity does for me, it's, it opens a lot of doors to, uh, and, and opportunities. And I feel as, uh, as an artist and as a writer, <clears throat> I feel that, that that talent is sort of like both a curse and a blessing, <laughs> you know, so to speak, you know, is because when I have an idea, <clears throat> it comes to me in, and it comes to me in a very visual way to where I have to write it down. It's so strong that, it just engulfs me and I can't, I can't function. I can't do anything until I like release it. And I can I only, I can only release it on paper, you know? So it's just so powerful. I'm also an artist. I, I, uh, I sketch, I draw a lot. And so sometimes I'll also draw it when I have an idea, but in terms of stories that come to my head, I can't draw them fast enough. So I started <laughs> writing them, you know? And um, as a kid growing up, I used to draw like all these little comic book strips and I look back to the stuff that I drew as a kid. They weren't really comic books. They, they were storyboards. They're storyboards for like a potential movie that's been playing in my head. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Yeah. And it's so compelling and I can't stop it. You know, it's, um, I, I mean, there's been so many nights I'd wake up at like 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. I'd wake up my wife. I'd be like, Sarah. <laughs> Go grab me, grab your phone. You gotta record this. Let, let, let me just get this out of mind before I forget it. You know, before I go back to sleep and forget it. And then I will spend like the next hour or two with her just like lying next to me, recording these ideas that's in my mind, you know. And that's the only time I can actually relax and go back to bed, you know. I love this. And yeah, so then <laughs> It's then like you have to birth it. <laughs> yeah, You're I like to you have to it. birth it, right? Because I can yeah, think of yeah. ideas. Yeah, I, I never I, yeah. It's hard to explain to, to yeah. others when I explain that. People are like, well, why can't you just shut it off? I'm like, I can't. I don't yeah, know it's, why. It's just a curse, you know, that I can't. If I don't. It's not a curse. You know what it is? You're tapping into something that is giving you downloads in a way that you're creatively creating. Yeah. That you're being inspired and your muse or whatever it is, it's giving you that download that you have to get it yeah, out. Yeah, birth okay. it. I call it birth exactly. it because what it happens to me in the middle of the night sometimes I'll wake up from a sleep. I have a notepad by my bed or I'll write it on my iPhone or something. I'll just, or I'll type it on my computer. I'll come up with some idea and I have to make it like flow. I have to put it out there in order just to get it down. So I, I, I know, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, it's like a download. So it's interesting yeah. that you're laying a similar type of uh, intensity. That makes me feel like what I do is pretty normal sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've done this since I was a little kid. Yeah. I mean, the first time I, I confided, the first person I confided to about this is my dad because he, 
came into my room one day and it was like two, two or three a.m. in the morning. I forgot. It was like in the wee hours of the morning, you know, and he came in and he's like, what are you doing up? Because my dad's a, my dad was a lawyer. So he would also stay up late if he has like litigation or whatever. And he, he has to do some research. So he'd, he'd burn the midnight oil as well. And then he usually go before he goes to bed, he checks around the house and make sure all the lights are off. Came, comes in my room one day and I was drawing furiously. I had this like idea in my head and I had to draw it. I had to draw this storyboard of ideas. And he came in and was like, what are you doing up? You have school tomorrow. And I'm like, I know that I got, I just have to like release this thing off my head. Otherwise I can't sleep. And he goes, why can't you do it tomorrow? I'm like, I can't, I just have to do it right now. He looks at me for a while and he goes, hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, when you got to take a dump, you got to take a dump, right? He just, he just, he just kind of, then he kind of walks off. That's how you kind of understood it. They don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even, so even at this stage of my life, I'm 45 and I'll talk to my mom. She's retired and I'll, I'm real close to her and I'll talk about my show. And she's like, that's nice. She doesn't watch it. She's like, that's nice. Like, I don't think parents sometimes understand creativity or how it flows or how right. important it is to express it, you know? Exactly. When you, when you work and you have your different roles between being an actor and a director and a writer, and I know that requires different skill sets, but like, it's almost like putting different hats on in a way. Like I yeah. do a psychic and a lawyer and I switch these things around. Do you find that out of your roles, which of these do you like prefer? Like, I guess you like writer the most, it sounds like from what you're describing, but it sounds like you yeah. also love doing movie production as well and directing. Yeah, I mean, I love them all. It's the, the entire. I love the entire process. You know, it's uh, it's it's just they all go they all go together. And but if I were to choose just one thing, if there's just one thing, like let's say, you know, Hollywood came to me with a big production and said, "Look, we love you. You know, we, we you know we have this idea for you. You you can make a choice. You can write it. You can direct it. You can you can you can act in it. I mean, what." Well, what would you do? You know, to me, the most fun to tell the truth, obviously, and I think everyone will tell it, will say this too, is acting. You know, that's probably the most fun, right? That, you know, be, I'll be, a, I'll be the, as I to say, okay, well, if someone's going to write it, then I'll, you know, I'll act. And if I can only pick one, one thing, then I'll act. It's, it's, it's way more fun, you know, like, and uh, I, I, I'm sure some people will, won't agree with that because they don't like acting, but I do. I love acting. You know, I love acting as well. So I love all aspects of, of production, you know, and um, writing would be probably second okay. and directing, which is actually what everybody calls me in for. It will probably be the last. I'm like the reluctant director. I've had <laughs> two films, three films already that I, I, I set out not to be the director, but to do other things like be a producer or, be, you know, be an actor. But then in the end, I ended up like, you know, I ended up directing it. And like, for example, Trigonal, uh, we, we basically interviewed like, I think like six or seven potential directors and time was ticking. The, the executive producers needed the movie to be, to be produced, shot and produced at, you know, at a certain time, um, time uh, a certain period because of, the, uh, because of the weather in the Philippines, the rainy seasons and all that stuff. Storm season was coming. And we still haven't found a director. So, and I was supposed to be the lead of the movie in, uh, in the original script. That was the plan. I was, I was going to be one of the leads of the movie. And then when it came down to the point where we can't find a director, everyone turned to me and says, why don't you direct? <laughs> You're a director. I'm like, oh my God, I'm rolling my eyes going, I can't play the lead role and direct at the same time. <laughs> so they're like, well, then why then, then, you know, then just take a smaller role and uh, and rewrite the script. So I furiously rewrote the script over a span of like like three or four days, <laughs> and um, you know, and then and then created a smaller role for myself, and you know, and then I started direct, I directed the movie. Were you like, damn and, it! Uh, I just yeah. wanted to be in front of the camera. I, I know, I know, I did too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the same thing happened to me in a couple other films, like Blood Hunters and all that. Yeah. I originally just wanted to produce Blood Hunters and have a, a director, but I mean, couldn't, we couldn't find one. We can't find one that can actually do it, you know. So, yeah. But you know, who inspired you the most, and why? In in different ways. I mean, 
I have been, I take my inspiration from different in different areas because I'm very multifaceted. Uh, in terms of film, uh, there's been I man I okay. Uh, what inspired me in film was when I was really young. I remember they still were showing they were still like showing double features. I was growing up in the Philippines, and my dad would like on the weekends they would take me take me to these double features, and I love kung fu movies. So I'd watch these kung fu movies, and it, I'd I'd like watch two movies back to back, you know, because um, because you, you know, because the, those movies back then were like, you know, between 60 to 60 to 80 minutes. And then they, they, you know, they, they play, play two movies back to back. So I used to watch all these Kung Fu movies. And I think that really opened my eyes, you know, and into like, I really want to do something like this. I, wa- I don't even know who the directors were. I just know that I just really enjoyed making Kung Fu movies. Then I had to have all these ideas of like, like, Kung Fu films and all that stuff, and then and stories that start storyboarding them. I start r- writing like little comic books, which is actually like movie storyboards. Um, that's that's what inspired me. And then Bruce Lee came along, and then I mean, yeah. oh my God, you know, I mean, who 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 isn't inspired by that guy, you know? Absolutely. And yeah, so in my my early days, in terms of like what really made me think about becoming a filmmaker was watching all these kung fu movies, like making you know, like and it's- especially. And when you watch it, it's got its own genre. It's its own art form in and of it's itself. It's got its own art form. It, yeah, right. It's it's truly one of those epic things that you just have to appreciate yeah. when you when you can when you can watch them and, and appreciate what they what they contain within them is so unique. And I, I want to ask you that when you look at those original films and what you're producing now, how do you find if there's some overlap and similarities in your mind conceptualizing it, not the script or whatever, but the ideas behind it? Are there is there some early motivation that or influence from those films that guided you in terms of what you're producing now or what you're writing about now? Mm, I have only one, actually all my movies are completely different from all this, from the, from the Kung Fu movies that I used to idolize. But the one thing that comes close in, th- in terms of genre, in terms of, you know, the, the storyline, which I wanted to make it more like, I don't know, I guess cliche, you know, because I wanted to focus more on the action was Trigonal. Trigonal is like your typical blood sport slash enter the dragon kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of idea. Basically, you, you know, the, the, the good guy goes into this like sort of island slash, you know, uh, uh, underground fight world, you know, where, you know, it's, you know, it's do or die kind of thing. You know, so, yeah, it's the basic premise of that. And it's a revenge movie, basically. <laughs> yeah. What do you? What is your view? I know you're in Taiwan right now, and I know you're, you know, there's been some some stuff going on over there. How is it producing films over there and directing stuff? And and like what what what's it like for you over there right now? Well, it's actually um, well, backtrack to like uh, a year ago. Uh, we were in the Philippines, we were in lockdown in the Philippines. We were just getting ready to start shooting a film. And on the first from first day of principal photography the Philippine government locked down everyone. You know? So we basically went into this, you know, this, what they call uh, ECQ or some kind of quarantine, like home quarantine, right? So everything, industry went, came, came to a halt and all that. And we waited for like about three months for the lockdown to be over. It, it only got worse. So that's mm-hmm. when we decided, you know, let's go back to Taiwan because Taiwan is, you know, has no, you know, time is like zero COVID cases, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty much it's it's everything is normal in Taiwan. So we went back to Taiwan. Um, when we came back to Taiwan, we um, we had a project we were supposed to shoot in the Philippines. It's this movie called Stay at Home, which is actually now it's been retitled and and has been um, it's now in distribution as well. It's called Blur Stay. Like you know things are blurred, right? So it's it's really a movie about about the whole quarantine you know periods in you know, the last year. The project is supposed to be shot in the Philippines, and we actually took it to Taiwan because in the Philippines, there's no way we could have shot it because of the lockdowns. We came back to Taiwan, and everything is completely normal. People walking around, you know, without masks and, you know, in, in large numbers going to concerts, whatever. So we ended up, like, shooting the movie here in Taiwan last year. On top of that, we also shot part of a horror movie that been, I've been working on. We actually shot, uh, shot the trailer for that movie. So I can start pitching the film, and um, we, you know, we we shot a, a few other stuff, and my wife also started uh, her own podcast slash web show, 
uh, talk shows. And was, uh, it's a That's excellent. Thing. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we were actually really busy in terms of uh, production work last last year. And then about early part of this year, I think around March, COVID hit Taiwan. So not as badly as it hit like other countries like the US or some or the, or the Philippines, but enough, you know, Taiwan's a very, very careful country. They, you know, people here are like super like conscious with sanitation and all that stuff because they've had, they've had experience of SARS before. Mm-hmm where they were really like hit, you know, in a bad way. So Taiwan immediately reacted to, to the, there was a surge, there was a few hundred cases in, um, in Taiwan that started. And it was a pilot that brought the, that brought the, uh, the virus in, got a lot of people infected. So then suddenly there was a surge or they were ranging like a few, a few hundred cases a day. And um, the Taiwanese people pretty much locked themselves down. You know, the, the, the country, basically the government, Put, uh, put the put the country into a, like a level three, which is not really a lockdown, but it's just more the people are just more like conscientious and they kind of lock the, themselves down. So we had no production going on for for since March, and then just about week and a half ago, we you know we're back to like level two, which means everything is sort of back to normal. So now we're kind of gearing up to to do some to do some production work in this next few weeks. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah, I pray but, you guys, yeah. I pray you guys get back to normal and, and, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. I think this, this whole pandemic has really affected a lot of people different in different ways, but in different ways. Yeah. And it's definitely affected people. That's the point, right? It's affected yeah. each of us in certain, certain manners. And yeah. certain, and I'm, I'm just happy to hear that you're able to take a situation and make it a beneficial one for yourself. And that, that's awesome. I yeah. Am, and, and I, I, I really, I'm so reluctant in telling people that because I know a lot of people have <laughs> suffered through the pandemic. Yeah. I want to, and I want to be sensitive enough to not tell them that <laughs> during, during, during the pandemic we actually made a lot of money, that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> so. I understand. I understand. I'm here in Florida. It's like the Wild West here. Like people are fighting with each other and arguing about wearing masks and social distancing. And oh, doing, I know. Yeah. And I'm just, I, I just stay home. I just stay at yeah. my place. I mean, aside from a little, a little incident yesterday at my place with a little fire, I had to deal with. Yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm basically making the best. And we're having a tropical storm this weekend. I'm smiling the whole way. I'm like, it's only a tropical storm. It's not a hurricane. We'll be yeah, all right. Yeah. Like, I make jokes about it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask you about C8 Studios. When did you first create C8 Studios? And tell us about it. Um, we created C8 Studios uh, last, uh, uh, last January, actually, this year. Yeah, so. Congratulations. Um, Thanks. Yeah, it was. Uh, we planned. We, we we had planned on doing that last year, but we weren't really sure because because we still have a production company in the Philippines, and we ha- we still have like a lot of um, like productions are pending. Um, should you know the, the pandemic be over, and you know we have something to we have some projects to work on, so we still have our company in the Philippines. So we kind of held off on on it, but then with the flurry of activities that we had, production activities that we had last year here in Taiwan since March of last. Where they've gone back? Oh, since June of last year, we had a bunch of activities. It just, you know, it just kind of snowballed to a point where we realized that we really need to have a production company here because now, now we're getting, you know, we're we're looking at getting grant money from from the film commission, that kind of thing. We're we're applying for grants, or you know, we're just there's so many different. And now we have we actually like my wife's show. She actually has advertisers now for her show for in the, for her podcast. So. And her, she's got a social media show as well, linked to that podcast. And so she's she's getting a lot of advertisers, and we, you know, to be able to handle all that stuff, we need we needed a company. So we started the company last January, C8 Studio, and um, mainly to be able to handle all the all the all the, all the jobs that we were getting in. Let's talk about Alex, April, and Ray. It's a movie. Alex, that- April, and Ray. Yeah. Alex, okay, so this movie has gone to so many different titles. It started off, the working title was Stay at Home, because they okay. didn't know what to call it. And the second one was Alex, April, and Ray, okay. which is the characters in the movie. And then finally, <laughs> the director, uh, Sergio, uh, Sergio Guerrero, he changed it. He finally, made, uh, finally changed it to Blur Stay, B-L-U-R-S-D-A-Y, like Blur, Blur Stay. Okay. So officially on IMDb, if you, you can find it as Blur Stay. 
that's that's the movie that I told you that we were supposed to shoot in the Philippines, but okay. we ended up shooting in in Taiwan. Okay, okay. It, it was it was shot in three. It was actually shot in three countries during the pandemic. It's crazy. You know, and it, that's interesting. You say that. Um, I think Hollywood's been pretty creative right now with the, the advent and the explosion of podcasts. Right, I very, think that's very. something that I seen happening. I had a uh, Kyle Chevron on, who's an independent producer, and they they have a podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, that were pro- professionally produced because it's easier to do that than it is to do the film production right now because of all the restrictions going on, especially in, in the United States and other countries. And I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned your wife has a podcast. I've been doing this for four years. Where do you see podcasting going in the future? Do you think it's going to, it's going to eventually blend in with other type of media? And do you think, like, how do you see it from your mind being a creator and being, you know, in the movie and film industry? Well, I see, I see podcasting. I, I think it's here to stay, and at least for the next several years. And then what happens is because of the pandemic, people are like, they're afraid to go out so much. You know, they want to stay in touch. The podcasts, a lot of the podcasts now are like, are so interesting because they, they bring in like a lot of interesting personalities. It's fun to listen to, listen yes. to all these different people. Like, you know, you, it, it keeps you in, in it, it, it gives you a, a a sense of what the world out there is is like without having to travel right so so i think podcasting is here to stay and how it's going to evolve i feel that it's already evolving where a lot of podcasts now like my wife for example she also publishes she, she she's got so, several social media channels she also puts out the clips in social media cha- channels she's got a youtube channel so a lot of her interviews uh, no, actually all of her interviews also go into her, into her youtube yes. channel so it gives people like that option. If they want to watch it, they can watch it. Then, the, and then through the podcast, she also does other creative things like she'll do because she does a parenting podcast and primarily like targeting like parents of like toddlers or younger children and, and newborns. So sometimes she'll do things like a live science experiment for kids, you know, and she'd have, have people like parents would, would actually like, would like join the zoom session live i'm thinking of a volcano you know the volcano experiment that's always they did that <laughs> they did something like that they did like not really a volcano experiment but they did like uh i forgot what they did but they actually like made like something fizzle you know it's like oh it's like so cool. a ro- rocket experiment or something like okay. that yeah yeah but anyway the kids love it so it's become really interactive and i've seen other people also do Similar things like they, they'd have a podcast, but then they'd go live and do like an instructional workshop with people. So it's really evolved into just a podcast. I remember one one of my favorite podcasts is obviously Joe Rogan, you know, and I, I've never actually seen his his Facebook, uh, I mean, not Facebook, his uh, YouTube show. I just listened to his podcast on, you know, on, on, on iTunes, but, um, but it's, it's, it's really like evolved to more than just that now, you know, people actually want to watch, you know, so watch the whole thing. So, yeah, I well, think it's, it's really evolving. And I think that, you know, so many people focus on the negativity of what's happened in the last two years, but when you look at the positive aspects of it, right, which is the yeah. advent of, of people being able to express themselves because everyone's like locked down and stuck inside. Yeah, well, yeah. A lot of people are making lemonade out of that, you know, they're, 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 they're letting their creative juices flow and they're, and they're making the best of it. And I think for someone like yourself, I, I, being creative is, is this outlet of energy that enables you to not just live your life, but yeah. then to share your experiences through your creative form as, with, as well yeah, as your wife, I, right? Yeah, and, and that's a beautiful thing. That's like a, a Van Gogh painting in it, you know, this amazing portrait or, or, or painting to, to put on a stucco wall or something. It's like when you can create your, your, your films and it goes out there and you, and, do you ever go back later and like sit with like circle of bones or circle of bones or look at one of your earlier projects? And do you just like put on Netflix or whatever, <laughs> whatever you can watch it through and just kind of sit there and, and do you watch yourself or do you, do you ever like appreciate uh, earlier no, parts of your projects I, that you're at now? Like how I do you, can't, how do you do it? I can't, I can't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, the only reason I would watch it is be, because I'm trying to critique it or there's something, some changes I need to make or whatever. But once it's done, once it's released, I refuse to watch it. I just, <laughs> I, I can't even stand seeing myself on screen. I, I, I love doing, I love doing it. I love like acting and all that stuff. But, but once it's out there, I, I like cringe. I'm like, Oh my God, what, how can anyone stand me? You know, but well, 
you know, the movie selling. Get, so, do you so get maybe, flashbacks? <laughs> do you get flashbacks of when you actually did the scene or when you actually created it? I like, do. I do. Personal aspects of that part. Yeah, I do. When I when I do some scenes, I like, I kind of have flashbacks with it. I'm like going, God, I could have done it better. You know. <laughs> Oh man! I, but no one else knows that, but you. You're the only person. I guess, yeah. I guess, way, right? Exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm like really my, my, my biggest, uh, my biggest critic. You know, yeah. You know what? So, I want to ask you about your martial arts background. How did you get involved in that? And share that with our audience. Where, uh, when you first became involved in Muay Thai, I believe. Muay Thai, yeah, yeah, Muay Thai, yeah. And uh, um, so tell us about that. Well, martial arts has always been always been part of my, my life. You know, like it, it's kind of like started around the same time as my love for film, you know, watching this uh, Kung Fu movies and, and uh, watching these Kung Fu movies. I'm like, I want to do something like that. That looks like fun. And my dad, like uh, originally took me to, to study like uh, Taekwondo and Tang Soo Do. And I, I, it was okay. I, I liked it, but there was something missing, you know, and obviously I didn't want to just do the forms and all that stuff. So there's really something missing. I, I, st- I go back to all the Kung Fu movies, movies where I see these guys jump around and hit each other and all that stuff. Right. And I'm like, I, I want to do something. I want to do martial arts just, that's more real, you know? And at that time, I mean, there's, you know, there's just karate and Taekwondo. And then and the one day we watched the fight at Lumpini stadium in, Ta- in, in Bangkok, I uh, watched my first Muay Thai fight. And I'm like, Oh my God. I just, my jaw just dropped to the floor. I'm like, Oh my God. I see these guys elbowing them, each other in the head, like, you know, kneeing and knees, elbows, kicks to the head, like, n- like full on. No, no one stops. No one gives anyone points. You just basically fight until, you know, one guy gets knocked down, knocks out or whatever, you know, at the end of the day, they don't even go with a point system. It's just the most aggressive guy just basically just wins, you know, and wow. um, if, if no one gets knocked out. And I told my dad, I said, dad, this, this is what I want. This is the martial art I want. I want a martial art where I'm really, really like kicking ass out there. You know, I want full contact. And um, reluctantly, you know, my dad finally like got me, found, found a, a Muay Thai coach for me. And I was about 10 years old and the rest was history. I never stopped ever since. I never stopped. You know, even if I, even when I was working full time or working in film or working in IT, even now as a dad, you know, martial arts is still a big part of me. You know, I, uh, I train as much as I can whenever I can. You know, it's just one of those things that you just can't get rid of. It's like, it's like food. food for the <laughs> and, and, and you're a world champion in it too as well. I was, I was yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Already, I know you're humble and I don't want to like make you uncomfortable asking you questions, but it's, it's an amazing accomplishment. So I wanted to see if you could... Yeah. Share that with us a little bit. I won my first title back. Um, I mean, back then there was like multiple organizations. There were smaller organizations. Uh, I won my first title back in 1994, 94 and 95. And then I stopped fighting in 96. And uh, in 2006, I, I stopped fighting for like 10 years. In 2006, I made my comeback. I decided to fight again. I was living in, in, in Asia at that time already and uh then i started going take you know taking like long you know long training trips to to thailand i started training in thailand around 2006 and started fighting by 2007 i fought the queen's cup which is kind of like a world you know like a world title event and stuff I fought at the queen's cup and won and then i fought at the king's cup the same year and also won so that's two that's two titles that's two basically world titles Wow. And then, um, and then the following year, I fought in another uh, another organization, um, WPMF, and also won the world title from a weight class. So wow. yeah, so yeah, so then yeah, and congratulations! Thanks, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you have a lot of skill sets. I, I would like to say, do you think? And I'm thinking this as we're just talking right now. Do you think there's going to be a future genre of more kung fu type movies? for a new generation coming up in the future? And what role do you think that would be look like? Well, they're like Kung Fu movies, they're, they're coming back. I mean, they're back. That's what I mean, yeah. Back. But it's just they're back in a different, with a different look. It's the same feel, just a different look. You know, they're, I guess you can say they're, they're a lot more violent. Like Kung Fu <laughs> movies 2.0, upgraded? <laughs> exactly. I, mean, or I, would, I would call it more like, like 
4.0 or something oh, yeah. like that. They're, yeah, they're pretty violent now. I mean, and it's pretty, you know, they were violent before too, but it's like, you know, the stories are a lot different. They're, they're, they're grittier. They're a lot grittier. Even the way they're filmed are grittier. Like like that, that series, uh, Warrior. Have, have you seen that? Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very gritty. It's very violent. A lot of martial arts, you know, and then um, recently in movies, they integrate that in the mar- in the uh, sort of the, um, the superhero movies like um, what's that? Snake Eyes is out. Tons and tons of martial arts in that movie. It's really basically finding its way into mainstream films. And a lot of the mainstream films would actually have martial arts, you know, and um, a Kill Bill but, type of movies, you know, like Kill Bill. But the Kill Bill, yeah. Oh, I love those. I wish <laughs> I, I wish would make more of those. Yeah. Now th- those kind of movies, I haven't seen much of. I wish they would make more of those. I'd it's a hybrid, make- right? You're taking, you're, hybrid. taking, you're taking, and you're morphing a couple different types yeah. of genres into a new yeah. kind of thing, and that's why I think yeah. it's, such a, it's such a a classic and it's such a hit in, in, yeah, in yeah. theaters, right? Yeah, yeah. I actually love, I love that. I um, I wish they would make more movies like those. I mean, Tarantino also made like the uh, uh was that uh, the uh, um, Men with the Iron Fist. Yeah, he did that, and uh, but. I mean, it, it's not the same. It's not. It's not like Kill Bill. I love Kill Bill. It's just so different. It, the the martial arts is like very cliche, very hokey, but you totally enjoy it. You know, yeah. I wish they'd make more of those. I, well, I'd like to make. I'd, I, I'd like to make one of those. <laughs> well, and I could see you doing that actually. Yeah, I can see you with a creative genre, some type of movie that's a yeah. hybrid as well. A, a exactly. Kind of yeah. Kill Bill yeah. Type of a film, and I, I would yeah, be yeah. loving to watch that. I'd love to see. The production of it and see it out there what do you think when you're looking at the united states right now and you watch us from you know over there where you're in taiwan and in asia but what do you what do you think of the stuff going on with aapi stuff and and discrimination with asian americans and i was gonna see like what do you what, what's your views on it and how do you think we could change it in our society in the film industry um, too, like hollywood yeah and, yeah well i hate to say it but traditionally asians asians in america I mean, they're just now starting to take a stand, but they've been very like passive and kind of complacent about this stuff. They're kind of like Asians are kind of like, uh, when, especially when I was living in the states, people they're more like you know I'm just gonna steer clear away from trouble. I'm 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 happy to be uh, not not second class citizen, but I'm happy to be a minority, you know, because it doesn't matter. I have a great life, you know. I have a great life. I have a great job, you know. I have a fat bank account. It doesn't matter. So, okay. So I'm a minority. No, no big deal. You know? So you don't like me. That's fine. You know, I mean, so you don't include me in your group. Fine. I have, I have my own group and we all, we, you know, we're all, we're all rich, that kind of thing. So gotcha. it's not um, because economically, a lot of Asians have always been like, okay, right. They're like middle class and upper middle class and up. Um, it hasn't really like, made a big impact on 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 them until until like during covid you know when when the, all this stuff started coming in living living in the states back then working in the film industry i the, that's one of the reasons i came back to to asia is i feel like it's really hard for me back then to break into become a director for example yeah. this is in the 90s you know it's yeah. really hard. It's really hard to become a director, and this is one of the reasons why I transitioned to to IT, because working in the film industry in the '90s, I I could just see that my ceiling is like really low, and mainly because I'm Asian. You know, I'm not. You know, yeah, yeah, and um, and I hate to say that people may disagree with me because it's no, I mean Asian, Asian Americans actually made it to the top, but when you really look at the number of us that we're trying to get in for in t- terms of ratio and proportion versus the number of the Asians that actually made it to the top. It's such a small, it's less than 1%. You know, it's just, um, it's just the, the opportunities weren't there for us back in the nineties. I transitioned into, into it where, you know, it didn't really matter. You know, it's like, and actually it was kind of like Asian driven. And, uh, and then eventually when I was, when I came back to Asia, I saw that, Oh, I'm, I'm mainstream now, you know, I'm not minority anymore, you know, so I got back to the film industry and of course I didn't feel the pressures that I felt in, 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 uh, in, in the U S and I, I was even bolder 
you know, in terms of like wanting to become a director, wanting to mm. be the top dog of a production, you know, so, uh, I, yeah, so I venture out to that. But yeah, and I feel that it's, um, it's still tough in the U.S., but I feel that the Asians now, because of COVID, it kind of uh, woke everyone up. And now they're like looking, not just, and it's not just COVID anymore. It's not just the response to, to the discrimination because of COVID. But now they're just really bonding together. The AAPI has, it's unbelievable. That, that organization has so much money. has billions heart, and billions of dollars. You know, yeah. My heart yeah. goes out when I watch, yeah. you know, atrocities on TV or I'm just hearing things and just hearing you share that just now, my heart goes out to you because I, you know, I'm a white male in the United States, but I, you know, George Floyd last year, it really opened my eyes to the differences in our society. And we're not, we're not as multiculturally blended as you'd like to think. I, I bought into it a long time ago to become an attorney myself. Like right. I believe in our constitution, the American dream and all that, but then I'm also looking at what is reality right now, what's on the ground and what's in the streets. And, mm -hmm. you know, I appreciate you sharing your perspective and point of view, like for me to do my show and ask questions <laughs> like that and get you to share that. It's like, you're taking that mask off that, that external thing that we can look at and you can look so, you know, you can have these amazing films and these amazing, pro amazing projects. But when you get real and you say, yeah, you know what, Jason, when I was in the United States, there is certain things that I had limitations on. I could not yeah. do what I'm doing right now. And, and you know, that, that makes me say, well, it's time to change that sometime, someday. I wish we could change that United States, you know, because yeah. the census came out yesterday for 2020, the results of it and like some media reports and I smiled when I saw the reality is that the, the, the white population in the United States is shrinking. You know what? That's the reality of the future of the country. We're a multicultural blended society. Right. And I look at things from a, as a psychic. I look at things from a spiritual point of view. We're all made right. up of spirit. <laughs> These are just external bodies, you know? And so right, right. Yeah. I know it sounds yeah. lofty to talk like that. And I'm probably having my head in the clouds sounding like that to my audience. But from my vantage point, I, I just think everyone, if you have your talent, like you have these amazing accolades and awards, you got to be recognized for that. And you got to have the ability in the United States to get the acclaim you deserve. Because yeah. I, I see that coming to you in the future. I see you having larger projects here in the United States, as well as in Asia. And I see you right. working with some big names that you're going to be excited about in the future. And you're going to have your own opportunities. So I, yeah. I'll blend that into the interview to tell you that. But I'll say. Thank you. I absolutely. So, 100%. Yeah. And I see, I see yeah. it in your future. And I think you're going to be very vocal in in different things. And, and I'm, I'm excited that you came on our show to share what you're sharing now, what you're doing. Cause I think you are meant to be in cinema and you're meant to be in film because I mean, ah, you could do Kung Fu, you could do it, you could produce your wife's podcast, but I think your greatest gifts are meant to be in front and behind the camera and coming up with the writing of the schematics. Cause I think that your films are going to inspire a lot of, they already do, but they're going to continue to inspire people. Thank and you. Thank you. I, I, I think sometimes when we go through situations in our lives, we have perspective that we can offer to others. Right. And what you're really when you think about it, you're a storyteller. You get to tell a story anytime you produce a film or you write a script or you do a project. And I wanted to ask you, how does spirituality or your perspective with spirituality factor into your creative flow, your creative juices for your films and for your projects? Like, how do you find your connection to spirituality. And I, I don't mean it has to be just a religious thing. I, I say spirituality for me, it means having your insight, your intuition, your, your, you know, when I, when I do certain things, I meditate a lot. So I'm grounded there. And I know when you do martial arts, there's a lot of grounding you do as well to have the perspective to train. Well, um, as a person, I am, I'm a spiritual person. I mean, I was, I was born religious, uh, you know, religious. I have a re very religious family in you know, the Roman Catholic and stuff, but I kind of like, got away from the whole religion thing for for a long time and but instead i became a much more spiritual person i like you said i believe that you know that the skin the whatever we our physical our physical stuff these are all temporary shells and what lasts forever is the energy the you know the soul you know whatever you call it spirit. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah and it's contained in our bodies but it's actually connected to the rest of the you're rest speaking my language, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, this, 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 this energy source that we have, I mean, this, <clears throat> this energy force that we have that keeps us going, keeps us creative, keeps us doing whatever we do as, as you know, in, in our life as humans, it's actually connected to the rest of the universe. So, you know, so when we pass on, this energy goes back. And yeah. reforms itself into whatever else, right? You know, into whatever 
life is in the, in the, in the, in the infinity, you know, whatever consciousness comes out of this. But because of that, I feel that a lot of the stuff, like even my creativity, my ideas, I feel that it's not just my own. It's, exactly. I feel like the, the universe is, is talking to me somehow. It's, and, and it's and not in a human way, not in a way where it's saying, hey, you must make this movie or you must, must make a story like that. It just affects me. It nudges me into a direction that I need, that I need to do. I stop, I stop like resisting life, you know, and, and, and being judgmental of myself or even of other people because life nudges me in d- different ways. I've, you know, I call them nudges, but in a lot of Guess ways. Guess what? Can, can I share something with you? Yeah, sure. I don't mean sure. to interrupt you, but you're saying something so significant to me that I have to share. When I was talking earlier and I was, I, I think I was picking up on your energy earlier when I was talking about downloads and like how we were comparing notes about when you're creative, you have to have your wife do certain things <laughs> to record you or whatever. And I, we were talking about that and I was, talking, I was alluding to downloads. I think in reality, I think you have intuitive abilities and you pick up on like everything you just said about when you cross over your energy and, you, and all, that's exactly what I get from, I do mediumship stuff too. And when people come from the other side and they come through and I know no one's dead that's a myth to me. It's not, it's a transitional state of mind. It's like when you, when I I tell people when they're grieving somebody, just think of your aunt at summer camp and you're just not there yet. Time doesn't exist there, but you'll be there at some point in the future when your life concludes. Right. I believe very heavily in that. And I think the fact that you're able to share that today, it just, in in terms of your own insight, you may not agree with everything I just said, but your insight on that is, is, is very intriguing to me. And and I consider that just amazing to share that. I appreciate it when I went on my little side ramble ramble there, but I, do you, do you have viewpoints about like, have you felt that you have intuition? You've called, you called it nudges. I used to call them vibes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I call them vibes too. <laughs> That's I before I realized I was intuitive, like psychic. Yeah. But I used to call them yeah. vibes and, and I'd read people and I tell them energy wise, I'm getting a vibe from you that you're going to have a kid next year. And next thing you know, they had a kid. My brother calls them vibes still, but I, I read people now formally. So it, for me, it's just, it is what it is, but that that's fascinating to me to think that you may have intuition and that's something that's a part of your creative flow. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I call them vibes, but, uh, but if I resist them and they, and I end up like being pushed in that direction anyway, I call them nudges. Okay. And nudges can actually be, can actually be painful. For example, if you have a vibe that you like, okay, you kind of have, if you feel like you kind of have to go this path, but you're like, you know what? I don't want to go that path, you know, whatever, you know, but somehow, somehow, you you know. up, yeah, sometimes like maybe even, a, I mean, even tragedy, tragedy strikes and forces you to go in this path. Whether it's painful or not, it's what I call a nudge. It's when we start resisting our destiny and then the universe pushes us anyway you know it's like you know when you're like when uh, when you're walking your kid and your kid's like you know like just wants to run across the street or something like that and you know cars and stuff and you basically just grab them a little bit forcefully and yeah it hurts a little bit and they cry and then in their mind it's like why'd you do that why'd you knew you hurt me that you stopped me or whatever because they live in this bubble right and they only understand what's inside this bubble they don't realize that you know had you let them run through they were, you know, this scar would have hit them. That oh, kind yeah. Of, yeah. You're saving someone's life, your child's life. And then for them, they see you as resisting right. and trying to control them. But that's us as individuals, yeah. as, as even as like mature adults that we think we're smart or whatever. Right. So that's us walking through life. Sometimes right. this invisible force, the universe basically nudges us because we're not supposed to be going that way. We think we're supposed to go that way because it seems like a cool thing. But that's not what the universe is intended somehow. That's not what the, exactly. you, know, you know, it will disrupt the energy of the world or the, you know, the, 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 the energy source or whatever. And it has to be this way. So you end up going that way because you serve a purpose. Have you ever noticed synchronicity in your life? That's something big for me. Like when I think about something and then the time lines up or I'll get put in a certain direction or a path and it lines up with something I was thinking about from a few weeks before. And next thing you know, I'm recognizing it as something I'm supposed to do. Like <laughs> yeah. it, it's a lot of different examples. It could be, it could be anything, but I wanted to see if you, if you recognize that as a force, it's kind of like a, a it's like a, a, a directional thing. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a lane that you have to get into. Yeah. You didn't see it until you got into it, then you're like, oh, shit. 
thank God I'm here. Oh yeah, this is the right lane for me and that kind of thing, you know? So it's that feeling they get when you get there, like, oh my God, synchronicity. And then you, you meet the right people, you end up going into the right, you know, lane together and then like, oh gosh, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, but it, I, it's, it's true. I can't believe how fast this interview goes. It goes so fast. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, how can our audience find you? I'm going to have your information in our show notes, but I wanted to see if, if there's any, if you want to direct them to your site or if there's anything in particular movie or project you want them to consider. Um, sure. I mean, I'm pretty easy to find. I mean, my, my website is vincentsoberano.com. That's my professional <laughs> site. I'm on I'm on Facebook. Uh, my official Facebook page is uh, Vincent Sobrano Films, Facebook slash Vincent Sobrano Films. Or you can just search me as Vincent Sobrano. Easy to find. I'm also on Instagram as Vincent Sobrano. It's Excellent. pretty easy. And on Twitter as Vince Sobrano. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm easy to find. Or just, just Google me. Okay. <laughs> I want to ask you this. If you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be and why? Does it have to be a real animal? It could be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> I really believe, yeah, I believe I'm a dragon. Yeah, I, I exhibit and I just have all the traits of, the, of a dragon. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I want to thank you for coming on the show. I mean, it's been such a delight to share all this with you and to get your viewpoints like that. That's so rewarding for me to have this opportunity for us. And I know it's late at night, your time right now. And you're like, on. are you on Saturday right now? You're, you're, you're uh, like, yeah, we're, we're fr- Friday night, it's Friday, Friday night. night. So it's 11 o'clock at night, your time. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, and sharing such a remarkable background story and everything else. I just, I appreciate you being able to, <laughs> to grace our show with this. I appreciate you. So <laughs> yeah, I thank, thank you so coming. much. I just want to thank Vincent Serrano for coming on the show today and sharing his insight. And I, you can't really talk about a more well-rounded and so many amazing skill sets. I mean, you're talking about an award-winning film, TV director, actor, writer, producer, martial artist, world champion, sports hall of famer. We didn't even get into that. Plus he's a coach. And, and I'm going to tell you, he's got big things coming up. So you don't win a bunch of awards with different independent film projects and get, and, and get to do all these things and not keep going. And that's what I see. The word keep going just keeps coming off of Vincent. I think he's going to be super successful. I think he's going to be in Hollywood, doing a lot of production films in the future. And I definitely think a lot of writing things. And, and so definitely check him out. The website for his pro, uh, for his website, C8 Studio, is in the show notes. And I will share all his social media, VincentSobrano.com, Vincent Sobrano, Sobrano Films, and the Facebook group and everything else. I, I find it fascinating when we can get notable people on the show to talk about real life things and talk about things that you don't normally hear in mainstream media, you know, AAPI stuff going on here in the United States. And those things bother me. And I'm, I'm praying to God that by having awareness and having candid, frank discussions, we can change minds one at a time. And when we change minds, we can change hearts. And when we're creative, we can express a part of ourselves that lives on. And each of Vincent's projects will live on. Each of these episodes will live on. Keep in mind, if you're a creative, aspiring person in our audience, Check Vincent out. Look at his information for influence, positivity, and I, I really do consider him a trailblazer. So keep this all in mind. Stay positive. I know that's been some challenging times we're going through right now, but things are going to get better. So when you stay positive, you're going to see things are going to improve. So I'm, I'm really excited about producing more content and sharing uh, additional amazing people like Vincent in the future. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And until next time, I can't wait to to do this again, but until next time, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook and don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind. Embrace your paradigms and know that the universe is always yours to explore.